All right, so what I'd like you to do, I know you just got settled, but I'd like you all to stand up. Stand up. I want to take a look at something. Huh. You aren't all the same size. How did that, how come you're not the same size? Because you're nine. You're 17. How old is Sarah? So she she's little. What's going to happen? Is she going to stay this size? No, what's going to happen? She's going to grow. You can have a seat. So all of your bodies are busy growing, right? You're not all at the same place. Very good. Have a seat. And let me ask you another question. Um, is Sarah able to read as well as you, Jackson? She's two years old. Almost two? Not quite two. Year and a half. Year and a half. Can she read as well as you? <laughs> you can read well, but can Sarah, this little girl here, read? How about Phoenix? Does he read as well as you? <laughs> Not real well, so he can't read. So what happened? And I bet you guys can read better than Jackson or Sarah or Phoenix. I'm hoping, right? <laughs> Not big well, that's right. Because he's still growing up, right? Your bodies are growing and your minds are growing. And real books have to kind of age their meditation. And that part, that's right. So all of us are, are growing in different ways. Do we stop growing once you get to your full height? Your body height? But does your learning stop? No, because I get you're gonna hope to go to college or to, to learn a trade or to learn something else, right? As you grow up. But what about our spirits? Should our spirits stay the same as they are when they're Phoenix's age or Sarah's age? Or should they keep growing too? We spend a lot of time thinking. <laughs> we spend a lot of time thinking about how our bodies grow and how our minds grow. And I'd like to encourage all of our families to pay attention to how our spirits grow. Our door today is about spiritual growth and kind of paying attention to how we can grow in our spirit. I got some tips for parents when we get to the sermon, and I got some tips for you too. Why don't we have a prayer? Are you ready? Lord God, we give you thanks for this day, for these young people, whatever size they are, whatever amount they've learned, and we pray that you would continue to grow their spirits even as you grow ours. Give to us um, the ability and the awareness to pay attention to our spiritual development and growth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please join me for the prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 38 through longer than 43. Um, I didn't realize until too late that I hadn't included all the verse numbers, so I'm going to read the whole passage I intended for you. Uh, there may not be words for all of it. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number to the, uh, that day. This is right after this, the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came out upon us, the beginning of the church. These are the first sermons that were being preached by Christians. Um, and what happened after they became believers is this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to be together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Thank you. So I grew up in Rock Island, Illinois. I have mentioned that before. I grew up in Rock Island, Illinois, and we did a thing in my family, and maybe some of your families did this too. As we were growing up, my parents would grab us and they would stand us up against the door jam between the kitchen and the living room, all right? Any of y'all do this? My dad would grab a ruler, when he was six foot four, my dad would grab a ruler and he would put it on top of our heads and he'd make a mark on the wall. And he would chart our growth as we grew up. Well, they had to sell their home a number of years ago and move into supported living. And that was really sad to leave those little tally marks of where we had been growing up, right? Well, this summer I sold, we are, we moved here. <laughs> we haven't sold our house, but we moved here. And we did the same thing that my, my parents did. How many of you had this happen in your homes? All right, so we kind of a thing. Uh, so we marked our kids on the door jam between the kitchen and the dining room. Well, it's kind of sad to have to paint over that and leave that behind from when Spencer was you know, able to stand for the first time and a couple of feet tall, but now when he's almost six feet tall, six feet tall, um, I love seeing all those marks and remembering the kids at different phases of their journeys and the race they had to see who was going to get to be tallest. Um, it's easy to measure kids and to see how they're growing. But it's hard to measure the spiritual growth. We can measure intellectual development, right? They accomplish first grade, they get passing grades, they move on to second. Their reading skills improve, their memory improves, they know more about the world, they have better intellectual capacity. We see that happen in them. But spiritual growth, do we do that? Do we know that there's a beginning place and a maturing that's required of us as followers of Jesus Christ that we're not supposed to stay two feet tall? <laughs> we're supposed to grow into full and mature Christians. It would be great if we could measure our spiritual growth in a tangible way. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? We are so glad to be here, Lord. It is a blessing to us to gather together, to see friends and family, to lift our voices in song and praise, to listen for your voice in our lives. I pray, Lord God, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you might bless us more this day, filling us so, so full of yourself we would share you with the people we meet. Our joy in this place and the strength we have in trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're spending four weeks exploring four doors that lead to faith development. Door number one was worship. Door number two, today's door, is spiritual growth. Christianity, like all faiths, is taught, not caught. We aren't born as Christians. Even those born into and reared in Christian environments have to study what it means to be Christian, and they have to practice the faith. The father uh, was telling a story about his son, who was an avid musician, a great musician, was going on to study more music, and as he was getting ready to leave for college, the son said, well, I think I'm not going to really look for a church, because I have a pretty good understanding of who God is. And his dad was like, well, how many hours a day do you practice your music? And the son said, well, six. And he caught what his dad was saying, right? He understood because the conversation was around church, uh, since it was on the subject of finding and participating in the church, he got the point of their question. People cannot grow in faith if they do not devote time to fostering that growth. Weekly worship, as we discussed with door number one, is a start for spiritual growth. But there are a lot of days in between Sundays, right? <laughs> like it's almost always not Sunday, unless you're a preacher, and then it seems like it's always Sunday. But if you're, like, if you're living your life, those six days take up a lot of time. Lots of days in between Sundays. I will teach you about prayer because that's one of the places where we experience spiritual growth. I will do that a lot because I love prayer. And I think it is one of the ways that God changes us, speaking to us, shaping us. But that's not going to be today. Today I'd like to talk with you about small groups. The first and most important small group that leads to faith development is the family unit. We have done years and years of studies um, on families where families trusted the church to do all the spiritual formation of their children. And we discovered that faith didn't stick. Right? That's kind of how I raised my kids. I thought that if they saw me go to church, if they saw me preach on Sunday morning, I thought that faith would stick. And it's been a kind of complicated outcome on that, to tell you the truth. We could have done better at home. We could have been more intentional in teaching them to pray and developing those habits with them. We could have studied the Bible. We read Bible stories when they were little with them, but we didn't take them up through their teen years reading the Bible together and exploring what the, the meaning was in Scripture. Sticky faith, the researchers have discovered, sticky faith happens because parents and families make it a priority in their home. So the very first and most important small group where spiritual growth takes place is in our families. And it can be as simple as starting out with making prayer a daily habit. Adam Hamilton told us this week that they're encouraging their church to use their fingers as reminders because you carry them around with you all the time, right? So when you get out of bed, say, thank you, God. You have three meals. Say, thank you, God. Before you go to bed, say, thank you, God. Let those five fingers remind you to pray five times a day. And if you are able to sustain it and hold it, pray more. Pray more deeply. Pray for bigger things, right? But start with, start with the habits and the disciplines that shape us. I mentioned this before, but the Wesley Covenant groups you have practiced here for many years, uh, those are an amazing model. As I see other pastors uh, out and about, they ask me, how's champagne first? <laughs> and I say, you're great. You're really a great congregation. Uh, I tell them about the system of spiritual growth through study, the Wesley Covenant Groups. I describe how a core group of leaders prays and plans all year long for these studies. I talk about how the class leaders get together during the course of the study to practice the lesson, to, to go through it together before they take it out to their small group. I talk about how there are seven or eight of these groups at a given time, and how 89 people have signed up, and they are... They have to repent of this after, but they are envious, right? They wish that they had a system of formation that strong and long-lasting, 20 years, right? This calls us the Covenant Group is studying the book of John and has added a community service element by inviting each participant to bring food goods in order to create Thanksgiving baskets for delivery to the friends of our, our, our friends at FG2, people who are struggling financially. Sunday school classes are a great small group. We have three adult Sunday school classes. We have children's Sunday school. 
They meet on Sunday morning at 9. These are a place for small group discussion and spiritual growth. Another small group is Minds in Motion. It's a group that gathers a semester of time to offer a place of support and encouragement, stimulation, and fun for people who might otherwise feel isolated and alone. I talked with Sandy Bergner, Bergner uh, a couple weeks ago. I am so impressed and so thrilled that this congregation offers a ministry like this. It is an incredible ministry. And it's a kind of a small group where people get to know one another, where they receive support and care. Youth group is a small group. BLAST is a small group. Youth group is for middle school and high school. BLAST is designed for younger children. Our choirs, praise team, and bells are a kind of a small group. Uh, experiencing the invitation to people to journey together in faith. Friendships are formed and difficult conversations can be had among friends. United Methodist Women are a kind of a small group aimed at fostering friendship and mission. Hands out in service. What other small groups can you think of in this place? Did I get most of them? So, I can't hear. Wrapped in His Love, the knitting group that creates blankets uh, for people. Knitting and crocheting, I think both. All right. I believe that this congregation is great because you have a deep spirit. You've been making growth marks on the door jam, spiritual growth. You've been marking your way and you've been growing up in faith. You are more connect you are connected more deeply to one another because you are thinking and growing in the same direction, <coughs> seeking God's will and God's way, trying to be God's love. Why are small groups so important? Do you remember the sitcom Friends? Of course, right? Everybody knows it's in conference. All right, it ran for 10 seasons, and you know what's happening right now? The movie. Right? So you can go to the theater, and they have taken four different uh, episodes, three different nights, I think is how it's going, and they are playing these, these old episodes of Friends. That's wonderful. I like Friends just fine. But what I really like is their theme song, the lyrics to their theme song. So no one told you life was going to be this way. Your job's a joke. You're broke, your love life's DOA. It's like you're always stuck in second gear when it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year. But next is, I'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you. Like I've been there before. Thank you for singing it, guys. <laughs> that was a nice touch. Well done. I'll be there for you because you're there for me, too. Small groups create groups of people who are there for each other. The church is really good at this. These friendships are holy, and they are a means of God's grace to us through life, skills, and values. Certainly, learning in small groups is great. I think we should study the Bible and we should discuss it and we should explore what it means. Having knowledge and information is helpful in reading the Bible, but can I tell you, United Methodists are all about being head smart, and I want us to be heart smart as much. I want us to be emotionally engaged in the process of building community. I believe the connections and the friendships that develop in the more intimate setting of a small group are vitally important the power, vitality, and future of church. Worship's great, but preaching is one-sided. I get to stand up here and talk, and you all do have to take it. You don't get to talk back. You don't get to tell me, well, wait a second, I don't know what that means. Small groups provide the opportunity for dialogue, for wrestling with the questions we have about faith, or God, or the church, or the future. Small groups give us a place to be known, really known, intimately known. So another question I get asked as I'm out and about with clergy, friends, and colleagues, and family, is this. How are you doing with the move, Julia? That's a deeper question, right? I usually say this. I'm doing great, too. <laughs> I'm happy to be at first, but the hardest thing is not being known. <laughs> After 14 years in one congregation, they knew my strengths and my weaknesses. And they had chosen to lean into my strengths and love me in spite of my weaknesses. 
They knew and helped me raise my kids. They journeyed with me through the difficulties of the teen years and the sadness of empty nesting. They carried me through the death of my father. They knew me. They helped me, right? So not being known is hard. It happened over a long time. And honestly, they came to know me best in small group settings because I feel most free to express myself where I can explain how I got there. Why do you think that? And then I can say, and I got to know what they thought and believed. Sometimes we agreed and sometimes we didn't. Small groups create a safe space in which we reveal ourselves and become known, really known. I'm, I'm crying because I'm really, really tired. Uh, I got a knock on my door this morning at 410. I had a police officer who was standing at the door, so I don't wish this on anybody. But we had a dog that was out of the country and was a, is a barky dog. And uh, we worried about moving him here, so we delayed it as long as possible, but we have moved him here, and he's still a barky dog. Um, he's used to having friends in the neighborhood he can talk to and did that. And, Thunderstorms scare him, so our neighbors who called, I gotta go apologize to them later. But he had woken them up, and so then the police officer woke me up, and so then it was like, oh, thank God it wasn't something bad, right? Like, it's just the dog, I can bring the dog in. And he was inside, he was just not all the way inside. So anyway, I'm tired today. Forgive me, I don't, yeah. Okay, David Brooks, a well known political commentator, author, and columnist, was the keynote speaker for the Leadership Institute. He's kind of a big deal. You know who David Brooks is? Yeah, he's kind of a big deal. He, uh, he, he writes for the New York Times. He's a famous columnist, political commentator, and author. Um, his faith expression comes through Judaism, but he has been deeply moved by the teachings of Jesus as well. He described the 1950s as a greater time of connection to the community. The 1960s ushered in an era of extreme individualism. Do you think that's true? Okay, he thinks we've run that course. He thinks that we have run that all the way to the end and find ourselves in this crazy place of extreme polarization in the group we look. In his travels around the country, he senses a deep longing for community. He tells a story of a friend of his. Their son had a friend who needed a place to eat and sleep from time to time, and he had a dysfunctional family and kind of needed a space. So they invited him in. Well, that friend also occasionally needed a meal or a place to crash. And eventually they started hosting Thursday night dinners. Young people began showing up until they were feeding 25 people on a Thursday night. David Brooks was invited to join them and discovered a place of community connection where the grown-ups showed all the way up with their presence, but also with their vulnerability. When he got there, he was introduced to one of the young men. He stuck out his hand to shake, and the young man said, oh, we don't shake hands here, we hug. David Brooks says uh, he's a self-avowed back hugger, <laughs> um, but he said that he stepped into that hug and he's been stepping into hugs on Thursday night ever since, as often as he possibly can. This group formed a community of safety and support, and when the young people started heading off to college, the adults promised to help them reach their educational goals. That's a lot of people to get to college. They prayed for each other, loved each other, and stepped into the needs that arose. When one young woman experienced kidney failure, an adult leader gave her one of his kidneys. This was community of the deepest kind. This group became the basis for Weave the Social Fabric Project. David Brooks writes on their website, the Weaver movement is repairing our country's social fabric, which is badly uh, frayed by distrust, division, and exclusion. People are quietly working across America to end loneliness and isolation, and Communities. Join us in shifting our culture from hyper individualism that's all about personal success to relationalism that puts relationships at the center of our lives. And Hamilton talked about elder orphans, people who are older and don't have people around them. Essentially, they're alone. Community. Weaving is a way of life, not a state of mind, not a set of actions. It's about the spirit of caring you bring to each interaction with someone else. You are primed for this as followers of Jesus Christ. You know this, right? This is who you are. You are weavers. It's a willingness to be open and loving whether you get anything in return. As humans, we long for honesty, connection, connections. Weavers 
make the effort to build those connections and make others feel valued. A weaver views their community as home, their community, where we live, right, as home. He tries to make it loving and welcoming. A weaver treats neighbors as family, regardless of outward differences. A weaver finds meaning and joy and connection and caring for others. Church people are weavers. We always have that. Do you remember the scripture reading? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship the breaking of bread, and I might say in our context, the sharing of cookies, the cutting of cakes and pies. <laughs> I'm not wrong, right? <laughs> and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Every day they continued to meet together. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praise God. It's a small group, right? And they're weavers for the community. Love at this level is about trusting one another's hearts, knowing one another's hearts. Even when we disagree, we trust that God is working and speaking in each heart in just the right way, at just the right time. I wish I had been here longer, but I'm going to take a You don't know me well enough, and you may not trust me yet. I hope we get to that place sometime. But I'm going to take a look here. I shared with you the debate we are having in the United Methodist Church. We have policies in place that discriminate against LGBTQ persons, and I disagree with these policies wholeheartedly and fundamentally. I believe that all people are welcome as they are in this space. I long for the day we will receive the blessings of pastoral leadership from LGBTQ persons. I desire the day come sooner rather than later when People in my congregation who are gay and want to make a lifelong covenant with one another can do that here. And as their pastors, I can serve them. That's where my heart is. That's what I desire. And I'm going to say this out loud because I want young people, I want parents of gay children, I want people who are in that LGBTQ community to know that there are many United Methodists who stand in the place of inclusion. If the loudest voices are the only voices you are hearing, or that you are not welcome in your whole self, that we are willing to tolerate you, but not celebrate you, I want to tell you there is another way, and there are other people. You may disagree with me, but I'm asking you to trust my heart. To believe that in my prayer life, and in my study of Bible, as I've opened myself to God, I have been led in this direction. As I believe God is speaking to you, wherever you are, on this particular issue. I want you to know that I sincerely love God and stand under the authority of Scripture as I have interpreted it. I want you to know that I will do everything in my power to lead this congregation to a place where we can welcome LGBTQ persons as they are, celebrating their desire to be in relationship and to serve God. We will have small groups after Christmas to gather together and talk with one another about our way forward through the difficulties that lie ahead for the denomination. I will share with you my coming out sermon, how I got to this place, because I haven't always been in this place. This has been a 30-year journey, and I'd like to share that with you. We'll do this all after Christmas. The general conference that will be held in May 2020 is the next moment. The decisions will be made for the whole church, and we want to prepare this congregation for the potential outcomes of that gathering. But about all of that, so I got through with this, uh, I got through with this leader, leadership institute and I was frustrated a little bit and slightly hopeless and I didn't, and I'm worried about the future. And my dear friend said, well, you know, you don't have any control over that. <laughs> like, oh, that's a point. And then she said, do what you love. You love the local church. Live in that space where people know one another and love one another and be with them. I can do that. I was glad for that word of wisdom. It is my hope that as a congregation, we will find our way together through difficult conversations, um, listening to one another, hearing one another's stories, and sharing our hope for the future of our congregation and the denomination. Will you pray with me? Lord God, who creates us, who made us, 
beautiful knitting us together in our mother's wombs. We give you thanks. We pray that you would open wide our hearts that we might love better, love more courageously, sacrifice more for one another, and live into your way of being in the world. We see those early disciples and how they gather together in that small group, breaking bread and reading the word, and trying to figure out who you were calling them to be and be following in their footsteps. Use our small groups to be a place of conversation and kindness, support and learning, that we might grow into your likeness. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from Reconciled people, let us offer. 